I'd like to welcome Chris Moser to our passenger profile for this month. Um, Chris is a rising star amongst taxi members. Uh, he, his name appears pretty frequently now in our success stories in the newsletter. And uh, some of his fellow members said, gee, why don't you interview him for passenger profile? So here we are. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here and talk to the legendary Michael Lasko from, from <laughs> the legendary taxi company. No, I have to say it's really, I'm really honored. Thank you very much. Well, I'm honored that you took time on a weekend to do this. It's Saturday night, like at uh, night. 9 p.m. for you. It's 8 p.m. It's 8 p.m. And um, we had already an apero, some prosecco on the terrace. So I'm really fine. The day is ending, but I'm good to go. I'm good to go. Good. Well, I'm really glad you're here. And uh, right up front, I want to say congratulations. I, I see you hitting home runs over and over again. But when I went and looked at your bio yesterday in preparation for this, uh, I thought to myself, well, of course, he's becoming successful. You know, you have like the perfect background to do film and TV music. So I want to read some of this bio uh, because it's it's well written and uh, people should know more about you. So Chris says at the top of his bio, music is my life. It's given me everything, my wife, my professional foundation, a multitude of inspiring moments on stage and access to the divine universe, universe of creativity with endless potential to create new things. Uh, you're of Swiss and Italian descent. Uh, you founded your first band at 13, which I think is probably very common amongst taxi members. Absolutely. As a guitarist, you covered Deep Purple, yay, Pink Floyd, yay, Santana with your band, uh, all great stuff. And then from then on, it was clear that music would be his life. Alongside composing and playing guitar and bass in several bands, he studied double bass, tough one, um, and guitar at the Swiss Jazz School from 85 to 88 and topped off his music portfolio with, with a sound engineering degree, which explains why your music sounds so freaking good. Your engineering you. is great. Um, you can competed with uh, or completed with top marks at Zepra, the Center for Professional Audio Recording Technology in Zurich in 1995. You founded Tone Art Productions Limited, a recording studio in 97, and the work therein provided you an ideal platform as a composer and producer. I would have to agree with that. You've created uh, countless compositions and productions for videos and industrial films, commercials, audio corporate identity, which is something I've been getting into a lot lately, just learning more about it, uh, and multimedia sound design and live studio live and studio recordings of various genres from pop to rock, jazz to R&B, and soul as well as classical to folk music. What a great background. Um, so you created the corporate identity jingle for the leading Swiss ICT company, Swisscom. Um, and that landed you jobs. I thought this was funny, landing him jobs over the years for variations of the jingle in a myriad of genres to promote their successful national campaign. So it sounds like that one was the gift that kept on giving. Um, in 2001, man, you were a trendsetter. Chris co-founded uh, the project Groovalizer, an internet platform offering music productions for websites and multimedia. Man, you were like 15, 20 years ahead of the curve on that. He went on to be certified with a music teaching degree at the Byrne College of Education in 2005 and teaches secondary school ever since. Sorry, folks, I've got to mute my phone. I knew there was something I forgot to do. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, let's see, he also conceptualized MIDI for sound engineers and Logic Pro Basics and advanced courses, which he's instructed at various Swiss institutions. He's been at the helm of development of such programs. And all the while, you never left the stage. Besides being in demand as a guitarist or bass player in various music projects and productions, um, uh, co you collaborate with your wife, the singer-songwriter Rhonda Dorsey, who I found out before we went live, edits all of his texts. So good job, Rhonda. Uh, with, with her, he co-composes and performs as their duo guitarist and is the musical director of her various R&B and gospel projects. All of these years of skill, honing experience, and enriching musical undertakings render Chris Moser a multifaceted, accomplished, and capable talent whose creativity knows no bounds. Anyway, um, yeah, all that to say, I wasn't shocked by any of this. 
by listening to your music, I, I thought, okay, this is a guy who started out with a foundation. Um, many taxi members really don't know anything about composing for film and TV. They're singer songwriters, um, home producers, and then they discover film and TV and they really have to start almost from square one. You didn't. Um, but at what point did you know that you wanted to make film and TV composing like the major thrust, if it is in fact the major thrust of what you're doing? Well, you're talking about now, now in the last. Yeah, so, uh, I guess what caused you to join Taxi and go after? Yeah, okay, Steve? okay. My, did I write this bio? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you mentioned Groovalizer, and Groovalizer was was a was a, a complete failure. So I have to say, just to be honest. It was a, a superb idea, but didn't work then. It was, we were just too early in the game. Yeah, the, way ahead of your time. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, the, the, uh, sometimes I think about it and I said, wow, this is actually the, the splice idea that we have uh, nowadays. But then it was just completely. I had some some guys who were uh, helped me, of course, with all the, the internet and, and the programming. But uh, we we figured out after a short amount of time that this is not going to it's not going to work but anyway it was interesting to develop an idea you know so th there i had maybe some uh, experience in de developing an idea so okay uh, it it all sounds like when i joined taxi in 21 that i knew exactly what what i was doing and it's not the case because <laughs> no it's because you know after all the background is 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 correct but I basically quit working for clients 20 years ago, you know, composing for clients, you know, what came after was like composing for myself, composing with my wife, gigging, you know, doing some client work here and there, more recording stuff. And, you know, maybe what I, what I can say from my experience is for working for clients is I have to, uh, serve the need for the, for for a client. You know, that this 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 I knew uh, that it, this was the, the the name of the game. You know, but when I started Taxi in twenty one, and I started that because apparently, like so many other people, COVID hit hard. We couldn't do any projects anymore, any uh, music music projects anymore, no no gigs anymore. And I had over the years collected so many ideas, and and it's really true. Every time I sat on the piano or sat on the guitar, some some uh, a spark of idea came up, and I said, "Oh wow, this this could be a nice song." I recorded it, left it on the hard disk. Maybe I'm gonna do a guitar album one of these days. I it was I was just floating in space, you know, with my idea, with no, nothing to hold on to. And then in 21, I said, "Okay, somehow." Let me go back and see what taxi is because I had I saw taxi already in like 20 years ago, 21, 22. I went, I, I looked into the the the, um, the system of taxi and somehow I didn't it didn't it didn't speak to me then. So mm -hmm. I just left it. But this time I was like, okay, I have all this experience, I have all this idea. Let me just go for it, you know. And but I had no idea. I didn't even know the word production music, you know, uh, no. in 21. I mean, I, I was I was creating production music for, for years, but I didn't know that this, this was production music, you know. Right. So I, I had to learn everything from scratch, you know, the form, what is a cue, uh, all mixes, uh, you know, metadata sheets and all this, this whole caboodle I had to learn from scratch, just like every other person, you know. Of course, I had the advantage of of having done a lot of stuff in new, in the music world, you know, composing, engineering, you know, playing and that. But uh, yeah, it was a it was it was a it was a uh, I had to really have a steep learning curve, you know, to 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 get to the point where I'm at now, you know. So you had one thing that you just mentioned that was it, yeah. it's incredibly foundational to all of this, which is you understood that your job, if you want to get paid for making music, most of the time, almost without exception, the goal is to serve the client's interests. And right. usually that is how can you elevate the mood or emotion right. in this picture, in this scene. Whereas many people start out, and rightfully so, understandably so, they start out like, I want to make the best song I can, and hopefully people will love it. And, and 
I personally don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I think that you can create music that you love, that clients find useful. And apparently you you discovered that. Is that a true statement? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I still fight that that instinct, you know, to to you know, you know, to sh show off basically, you know, I, I still have to fight that instinct. And that's why I can never write a cue in one day. I, I, I just don't allow myself to do it, you know, because I have to listen to the cue the next day. And mostly I take off a lot of stuff, you know, because I just pack too much stuff in it, too many ideas, you know, and, and I'm still learning, you know, to just keep one emotion one and not you know because you feel like oh it needs another angle no no just stay with with this one emotion and yeah i learned that really early on when i was working for clients I, I, just this little story i had this video producer that he always came back to me for music for his videos he was doing videos for car commercials car no more like this um this corporate uh, videos you know not not for tv but you know for exhibitions and stuff and I early found out that he he likes kind of jazzy, funky stuff. But at the beginning of our relationship, he came in and said, oh, this, this song is nice, you know, but, you know, it lacks something. And I was like, you know, racking my brain. What does he want? You know, because it, it, the problem is also that a lot of people don't know it, to express themselves in a musical way. So you have to like really figure out what the heck they want, you know. But yeah. then... I found out, and that was so eye-opening. He just wanted a saxophone. So <laughs> I just put in every cue, I just put a saxophone. And he was happy. <laughs> he was totally happy from, from that day on, you know. So there we go. He wants a saxophone. You give him a saxophone, you know. I mean, this even though I, I thought it was like, okay, can we take something else? No, it's this guy coming back. So give him a saxophone, you know, and, the, you know, to serve the client is the most important thing, you know, you have, otherwise you you don't have a job. That is yeah. It's, and it's a hard bridge for a lot of musicians to cross, to have that switch clicked that tells them it's not what I like. It's making what the client will like and being able to discern what the client likes. It would have been a lot easier if that gentleman had just simply said, hey, can you throw a sax on there rather than make it more purple? <laughs> I mean, he, he couldn't even express that. You know, I had other other cases where it was so hard to find out what the people really wanted, you know, which is, of course, now a complete different thing with tax, you know, with the briefs, you know, it, it's just they, they are really they're most of the time they are very clear if you read them of course right you have to read them maybe you have to read them twice three times or even four times you know to 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 understand so so i mean that that uh, that was the really like the pivotal moment where i i saw something to hold on to with with tax you know the briefs and i i, I it just it, it ignited something in me which was like incredible you know i just was writing cue after cue i finished it i finished the cue i didn't like write 100 ideas and left them on the hard disk to to review later but i sat down i wrote a, a cue and i wrote the next cue and I, I submitted it you know and that was a complete different game you know that was for me so inspiring but you know it's really inspiring and then seeing also success coming out of that even though sometimes you have to just be patient you know i mean i think patience is this the number two virtue that you have to have you know in this game i mean it's just you just have to have to be patient you know at the beginning i thought oh cool yeah you know i'm gonna write attention cue and uh, a week later it's gonna be on a next netflix series no it's not gonna work like that <laughs> And I understand why so many people think that's the case because they are proud of what they've created and no matter how they're pitching it or where they're pitching it, in their minds, I think a lot of musicians have this mental image of somebody, the decision maker on the other end, sitting there going, I can't wait to hear this new music from Taxi. It's not the only thing in their day. And they're not waiting as fervently as people might want to believe. And of course, they don't consider the fact that there could be 12 others that got forwarded or 91 things that got forwarded, whatever the number is. Um, 
in their mind, it's their thing that's going to be heard by that decision maker. And he or she is going to flick that switch. And the next thing you know, the money's going to show up in 30 days in your bank account. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not uh, not uh, 18 years old uh, anymore, you know, and full of illusions and stuff, you know, because I, I know I'm a really small wheel in a huge machine. And if I turn a little, you know, to the left, it will maybe take years for that for that big wheel to turn in my favor. You know, it can maybe take four, five, six years. Who knows? You know, who knows? So I'm uh, here turning my little wheels. What genres are you most comfortable making? Uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, no, it's not so difficult. Everything that includes like guitar, I mean, just in general, all this like soul, R&B, funk stuff, jazz, of course, because this, this is one of my strong backgrounds, jazz, jazzy fusion stuff, um, pop, you know, and Apparently, stomp and clap. I'm I'm really doing well with stomp and clap, a, a term I never heard before. A joint taxi. I mean, uh, stomp and clap. If somebody told me stomp and clap, I, I thought that was some kind. I don't know, a sport, just something. <laughs> something you go to the doctor a and moved. <laughs> yeah, or it's a dance, some kind of it's an Irish dance. I have, I have no idea what that was. <laughs> River dance. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. But you know, once I figured out, it, I I could bring in a lot of stuff that that you know uh, it really speaks to me: rock guitar, you know, cool uh, drum grooves, and and all kind of crazy stuff. You know, yeah, it, it's uh, these are the things. But I, I also tried fantasy trailers. I, I I tried action trailers, and it it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to create stuff uh, in 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 genres that 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 you never did before, you know. And you learn so much that I think also helps in in other genres, you know. If if you're uh, writing in other genres, you know, if you maybe not so successful, you can't do everything. I mean, that's clear. That's clear. I went to your homepage, your taxi homepage, uh, yesterday before I left work. And I listened to probably 20, 25 of your pieces. I would listen to a couple, then skip down a few, then listen to a couple more. And I came across some of your orchestral stuff and I went, wow, there are very few members that are capable or even great at several, if not many genres. And I, I would put you in that category. Um, so I want to know what your process is when you're tackling a genre that you're not comfortable in or familiar with. What okay. do you do to learn it that you can produce stuff so good in a genre you're not familiar with? Well, I, I do that even with 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 uh, genres that that I'm familiar to. I I just listen to tons of other stuff, you know, and and I I I you know I, I copy I I bring in a file an audio file from my other library in a genre that that I, I don't know and put it in my session. And I'm trying to listen, what is the gist of this whole thing? You know, I'm trying to find out what, how does this complex machine work? You know, and, and I, yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. I watch YouTube videos about uh, string composing, string programming. And I, that was like last year, I, I just said to myself, I think it's about February. I said, February is my trailer month, you know. And that just, you know, uh, uh, really like jumped into that adventure to find out how trailers are are made, you know, and I listened to a ton of trailers from uh, really, uh, really good libraries. Brand X, for instance, you know, they have like amazing music and I just listened to it, bring it in my uh, my door, bring it in my session and, and try to basically not copy, but recreate the the, the feeling of, of that music, you know. That That's seems to be a, a difficult task for people until the, the switch gets thrown on that, which is looking at the whole thing rather than copying something. Uh, th this is goes to reading the listings carefully and using them well. Um, a lot of people early in their taxi membership will try and copy what the references have versus looking at the overall picture. Well, the tempo is pretty close on all these. They're all in a major key. Oh, by coincidence, they're all in the key of G. Um, so those are all hints. They're not hard, fast rules, but they're all hints. That it's like if you're going to make 
stew. You know you need potatoes. You know you need chunks of beef. You know you need a brown gravy. Those are the common things. And, and you seem to have figured that out early, which is probably goes back to your foundation, but quickly. Uh, I, I mean, I, I looked at your submissions and your forward rate. It's like you were getting it pretty darn right very early in the game. And uh, a lot of people uh, would be envious of that. Do you have any tips on how they might speed up their learning curve? Well, well I mean, you know, a part of, you know, having the background that I have, I mean, it's, it's just, I see a lot of people composing stuff for a certain jar and they don't they don't have a reference you know they just know i mean i'm just working right now on a collection which is called alternative fun funky pop music you know and and it's like a, we're working like a collective you know a group of composers you know and you know there there are some entries in in, in to this collection uh, i just listened to one today he just read funk, but he 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 didn't read the, the rest. He didn't read alternative, funky, fun pop. You know, I mean, the the two one of the two main uh, uh, titles is alternative pop. You know, and this got to be in there. I mean, he wrote a fantastic funk uh, cue, but nah, it's you can't use it for that collection. You know, so I think it's it's really. You know, read it carefully. Don't just take out what you think it's. Oh, oh, that's oh, fun. I can do that. Right. Do fun. Let me let me play a funk song. You know, and uh, oh, well, there's another word, alternative pop. Yeah, well, maybe it's it's good enough for that. No, it's it has to have these parameters that are that are asked for. You know, otherwise it's just not. It's it's great music, but it's not going to fit the the collection. You know, and for me, I I think in all this. These cues that I wrote, I mean, there they are, they are over a hundred cues that are now uh, sitting uh, on, on, on albums in libraries. I, I don't think I wrote a single cue without a reference being in the session, in the actual session of the cue, you know. I always have a reference song, a reference track in the session just to check out where is the bass drum, what the bass, what's the bass drum sound like, where is the snare, the hi hats is it the hi hat and the, and the shaker where uh, what kind of synths are they using how does this all interact you know and how do i get the same sound without copying and and I always go back and forth how does my cue sound how does the reference sound i mean it's a constant back and forth until i think okay i think i got it right and from that moment on i start to compose the rest of the of the track you know with maybe a second part or whatever, you know, and, and this is for me so crucial. I I I I I am not specially talented. I just try to 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 take advantage of all the materials out there. That that just it's it's a less you know a free lesson, free lesson. You have to take the time. You have to take the time to listen. We work really hard to put together those listings and make them better than the average typical industry brief. People, you know, at library owners always compliment us like, wow, your briefs are better than any I've seen anywhere. But we make them somewhat instructional because we know that people need to learn that very valuable lesson that you just talked about, which is looking at every little aspect, making great funk. It's great funk, but it's not alt funk which is what they asked for it's i don't know if you've ever seen the taxi tvs where i talk about when i was a shoe salesman as a young teenager okay. and, oh. and a customer comes in and wants a lady's punk, you know with a three and a half inch heel and you bring out a men's penny loafer they're both great shoes but they're not what the lady needs look um, mike I, I saw everything you 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 did i saw all the taxi <laughs> oh, thanks <laughs> no, I mean, you know, that, that that's how I learned. You know, I I I I committed to this game, so I needed to learn it from from the horse's mouth. You say, I think, right? Yeah. Okay. So I had to learn. I had to learn from you guys who who, who run the, the the show. You know, and uh, it's crucial. It's absolutely crucial, you know, to 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 do what is asked for, you know, and and you can, like you say, you know, with the the, the comparison with the shoes shoe sale, is like you can you can write the, the the most 
beautiful, most creative piece of, uh, of music on earth. But if it doesn't fit the scene, if it doesn't fit what, what, what they are looking for, it's useless, absolutely useless. You know? And it's hard for people to swallow that because it's, it's so much effort and emotion into creating it. But they don't realize or pay attention to the fact that they've gone off the path and created something that's wonderful, but 20 degrees left of where it needs to be. Okay. And then they're disappointed and they blame taxi, they blame the screener, they blame the industry. Oh, they're just trying to keep me out when in truth, they're searching for the perfect thing for their need. And you've obviously figured out how to give it to them. Um, did you start getting forwards right off the bat, like very early in your submissions? Did it take a while to ramp up? How did that go? Well, that's a that's a funny story. I I did my first submission for like I think it was a down tep tempo lo fi chill hop listing, and 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 I used one of my tracks that was sitting on my hard disk for twenty years, maybe or fifteen years. I don't know. I, I spruced it up a little bit. And it got forward. It's first submission, yeah. first, and I was like, "Yeah, I know the game." But then, what came after that? <laughs> was, Smack uh, you down and give you a little humility. Absolutely, right? absolutely. you know, it was a a, a big a punch left and right, a, a big hook <laughs> on my on my on my chin. No, no, of course. Then I had like fifteen or sixteen returns, you know, and then. Uh, yeah. Then I then I figured out. Okay, okay. Is that that was just a, a lucky punch at the, at the beginning, and um, it's it's all good. It's all good, and all all the all the the comments from the screen made sense, you know, and and that that what what really um, inspired me and say, okay, look, read the stuff, learn, and and go on, you know, suck it up, go on, you know. I mean, that's the name of the game too, you know. Just, just, I'm looking. Oh, I can't find my bumper sticker. The right submit. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow, please, please, where... please bring it for me. So in my, this is also in my episode. <laughs> <laughs> I wow, I've never not been able to find that bumper sticker. Oh well. Um, <laughs> let's talk about collaboration. Do you, do you collaborate pretty regularly with other members? I am bad with that stuff so far. So far, I mean, I I have some ideas. You know, I definitely w w would like to um, to release a, a, a vocal R and B album with my wife because she's an absolutely talented singer uh, and arranger and stuff. And I I I am talking to uh, right now somebody who lives close to me. He's a he's a South American piano player and he plays really this cool. Uh, stuff from south america and uh, we i would like to call out collaborate but I, it's right it's, i have just too much stuff right now going on you know and the little time that i have i'm just like writing and try to get the cues done you know but because color collaboration just takes more time yeah you know, it's, it's just you know that's just the name of the game but we'll uh, definitely put me on the, on on the next level you know i'm sure i'm sure but uh you know I, I'm totally open to it. I just didn't get to that to that part yet. I know? think you'll find that finding the right collaborators will actually increase the speed and frequency of your output because you could have two or three things in progress. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and I know that some of the members who have told me uh, or asked me, are you aware of Chris Moser? Um, they're all people that you should collaborate with. They're they're all talented, they're all fast, and they're all responsible. And those things go into a good collaboration. You know, yeah, when, yeah. when you say to somebody, hey, let's work on this together, and they don't get back to you for three weeks with the first note, that slows you down and you probably miss an opportunity. Whereas the, the people who have mentioned your name to me are all people that understand hitting the deadlines is important. And if you send them some, and you have an advantage, being in a European time zone that you're, if you were to collaborate with American counterparts while you're sleeping, they're working and vice versa. So that really does speed things up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will, it will become a 24 seven hour, a 24 seven machine, you know? No, right. I, absolutely. I am totally open to that. It, I just, I mean, I, I, I see, I, I consider myself still being a newbie in this whole business. You know, I, I just had my first, album released last year in March, you know, so it's, it's really, you know, I'm 
still new to the business, you know, and I know it takes years, you know, to to build up something substantial, you know, but and I'm totally open for that, you know, I would love to, I would love to collaborate. How have you found, uh, let me restate that, so many people have been taught for decades that people in the music industry on the end user side, the person with the power to sign you, that they're almost like they derive pleasure from saying, nope, not good enough, or nope, not what I want. And A&R people, and to an extent, music supervisors, maybe even music library owners, a lot of people, until they deal with them, have this perception that they're trying to break hearts and keep you out of the industry. I've always found they're desperately looking for the next thing that's going to make both parties money. How have your interactions been with the library owners that you've met so far through Taxi? Great, really great, except one that just uh, vanished into oblivious. I have no idea what, what, what they're doing, but no, otherwise, you know, 90%, uh, I have to say, absolutely great people. They became friends, you know, yeah. and, and with with some libraries, I, I, I'm... I'm uh, um, I'm texting and sending emails on a weekly base, you know, we, we go back and forth, they, uh, we be working on collections and, and it has been absolutely a, a joy, you know, working with, with these library owners. They are absolutely down to earth, nice guys. Mostly they are musicians, you know, who started off like everybody else writing some cues and then they turn into library owners. And yeah, but it's funny that that you talk talk about that because before I started to 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 do production music, where I didn't know what what that was, you know, I was always like kind of imagining. I knew that it wasn't true, but you know, I my imagination was like all oh, all these shows, you know, these are like it's it's, it's a group of totally you know uh, uh, f fashionable guys, you know, and and super talented sitting in a multi -mil million studio in Los Angeles writing all this hit music for all this television shows you know and i thought okay first of all you have to be young you have to be you have to live in la you have to have a mansion mansion with a with a mil multi-million dollar studio in the basement to, <laughs> yeah to like even... me see there's my studio right right right, right. <laughs> to, to, to even start in a business you know it's it, it, the, the truth couldn't be further uh from that you know it's it's and and you know what hit me was when when, when i found out that Per episode, they need like eighty to one hundred twenty cues per episode. I'm not talking for, about this for reality TV. Yeah, reality TV. But you know, and how much, how much, uh, how much is being produced every year? I mean, uh, well, of course, now we have right, we are in strike now. But let's say on a normal year, but it's amazing. I mean, this can't be just one uh, uh, fancy group of guys in a multi million studio producing that. That needs. I mean, it used wow. to be that way, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah that's um, true. That's true. That's back, true. In, back in like the 60s, 70s, and 80s, production music libraries, the, the deal was it, it was a relatively small group of composers that were tied into a pretty small group, like 5, 10, 15 libraries, many of which went on to be, you know, the big KPMs and the Brutons and what have you. Um, and, and I, not trying to take personal credit for this, but Taxi was actually the catalyst that made it possible for people like you to participate in this industry. It was all because a lady named Susan, uh, I won't say her last name, but uh, she owned a library that was small but active, and she was a, a veteran of that part of the industry. And she called me one day and said, I'm a little fascinated by your company. Do you think you have any home composers that can make horrific music? And I said, horrific, like horrifically bad or horrific, like for a horror flick. And she said, yeah, the latter. And there was a guy, I think his name was Steve Clark from Van Nuys, California, which is a half an hour from where I'm sitting right now. And he made stuff on three ADATs that were synced up in a home studio back in like 1994. She signed it, got him some placements. And that was literally the shot heard around the world where, wow, home studio people, home producers, composers can enter this business. Cause it used to be that the top 10 composers would make little demos, you know, like, like on a synth or an electric piano or something recorded on a TX four track 
send that and a chart off to the library owners and the library owners would pick what they wanted to do, then rent a big studio like Ocean Way or whatever, and come in first with the rhythm section of all great session players. Then next week they're doing strings on a hundred different tracks. The week later they're doing 40 tracks of, of horns. And the stuff was built in a factory like way that was very cost efficient and the music was actually played and produced and engineered by great people but it sounded homogenized because it was coming from the same players the same studios the same composers all the time therefore people thought of it as canned music which was kind of a derogatory term very very i remember that term yeah the can, yeah can yeah yeah, yeah 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 it's like oh you use canned music but yeah actually it was pretty well done but it was all sounded too similar like elevator music and thank god that lady susan called me up she I, i've remained friends with her like for 30 years now and, and i don't think she fully understands what a pivotal moment that was for an entire industry on a global basis because she made one phone call uh, yeah you, you you can't emphasize enough uh the, the the role you guys play in this whole industry i think that there's there's no company that comes even close to what you guys are doing you know i mean this is thank you i mean come on you know how many 30 something years you know yeah, we're in our 32nd year business you gave so many opportunities opportunities to 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 people life life changing opportunities i mean it's thank you very much i mean this is just incredible i think you know and just like like you said i i i'm coming from that period of time where just how you explained you know music could, music on a high level could only be produced in big studios big names big money and and somehow i had this like it was like in my dna so so to 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 see no my home studio my bedroom studio is actually totally enough you know to to produce to produce absolutely uh, nowadays you know a decent uh, mac laptop with with logic on it a 200 dollar usb microphone uh and a thousand dollars worth of plugins and and you're good <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I stopped. I stopped work uh, producing on Logic, really. Let's say professionally in, in two thousand two, two thousand three. I stopped, and I picked it up like uh, two and a half years ago. And and I mean, man, the, it's just like a totally. It's a new universe, you know. I mean, it's just <laughs> like. I mean, it's just like crazy, you know. I mean, I, I just really the 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 amount of tracks you can with the and, and the the quality of of the plugins and the samples and everything. I mean, it's just light years away from from how it was twenty years ago, you know. And uh, and it, I, and it it also it's also a bad thing because there's no excuse anymore for producing bad. <laughs> I mean, there's no. Excuse. Sorry, but people I mean, are intimidated by all the possibilities. I feel that way about Excel, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Word. It's like I use the basics all the time, but I'm intimidated to have to go deep and learn all the stuff that you can really do like in Word. Uh, and the part of the problem is that I don't need to use those features on a daily basis. So you learn it, you solve the problem in that moment. And then six months later, when you need it again, you have to go relearn it. So for people like you that are doing music every day in Logic, you are learning all those neat things that they've built into it now, but you're using it today and tomorrow and next week. Absolutely. So it becomes habit. It's like, it's like a language. You can't learn a language and then not use it anymore for, for five years. It's gone, you know, it's just good, good analogy. <laughs>